In our headlines on this Monday afternoon, November 27th, Prime Minister Han Dok Su is in Paris. For the General Assembly of the International Bureau of Expositions on Tuesday local time, that will decide the host city of the 2030 World Expo. Meanwhile, foreign ministers representing Seoul, Beijing and Tokyo met in Busan on Sunday and addressed, among other matters, the prospects of speeding up plans for a trilateral summit. And in the Middle East, the hostage prisoner swap between Israel and Hamas continues with hopes of an extended ceasefire shared by the Palestinian militant group. Prime Minister Han Dok Su is in Paris for the General Assembly of the International Bureau of Expositions, better known as the BIE, on Tuesday, during which a secret ballot will decide the host city of the 2030 World Expo. As the co-chair of the bid committee for Busan, the Prime Minister took to a social platform before departure on Sunday to pledge to do his best until the end to bring home the global event. A final presentation will take place prior to the crucial ballot on Tuesday as Busan shares its plans to promote the World Expo into a platform that tackles common challenges including rampant conflict, climate change and digital divide. Busan is competing against Riyadh and Rome. And as we await the result of the vote on Tuesday by members of the International Bureau of Expositions in Paris, our culture correspondent Song Yujin chronicles Busan's campaign to bring home the 2030 World Expo. Do take a look. The decision on which country will host the 2030 World Expo is just around the corner. South Korea's second largest city, the southern port city of Busan, is competing against Saudi Arabia's Riyadh and Italy's Rome. While this year has been packed with Expo-related events, Busan's preparation started years before. Busan's efforts to host the Expo have been ongoing since 2016. Throughout the last seven years, South Korea as a whole and the city government have worked hard. For example, Busan promoted its Expo bid to regions that it did not have close contact with before, such as Africa. Korea has gone all out to bring the Expo to Busan. Designating the 2030 World Expo Busan as a national task, President Yoon, Prime Minister Han duk su and Foreign Affairs Minister Park Jin traveled to dozens of countries to rally support. President Yoon even took the stage as a speaker during Busan's fourth presentation to the Bureau International des Expositions. The private sector joined forces too, with the leaders of Samsung, SK, Hyundai Motor and LG going overseas as economic delegations, promoting the Busan Expo by screening promotional videos and installing large-scale advertisements. According to the Prime Minister, government officials and business leaders visited 180 countries, all told. Businesses also worked diligently at home to boost domestic interest. We teamed up with the Busan city government to establish this designated area for the 2030 World Expo in hopes of bringing it to Busan. I didn't know that Korea had prepared so much for the Expo bid. It makes me realize how important this is. I really hope Busan wins. Renowned cultural figures joined in too. BTS held a free concert in Busan and soprano Cho Sumi, along with singer Sai and Espas Karina, took part in Busan's BIE presentation. But the heart of Busan's campaign lies with the unrivaled enthusiasm of the people living there. Thousands welcomed the BIE when they arrived at Busan train station in April for an on-site visit. I would go after almost 20 years in expos and I have been on many, many inquiry missions throughout expos. I don't think I have ever seen such an enthusiasm in the local population uh, for an event. Behind this was the Citizens Committee on Busan's bid for the 2030 World Expo, which also organized the Gwanganli Fireworks Festival and Expo-themed movie and music festivals with the public. Busan has experience hosting major international events like the World Cup and Asian Games. So we have the know-how, the facilities and efficient transport infrastructure. That's why Busan is ready to successfully host the Expo. With fingers firmly crossed, all that's left now is for the 182 BIE member countries to make a decision in Paris on November 28. Busan fighting. Fighting. Busan Expo fighting. Busan fighting. Song Yujin, Arirang News.
and President Sergei is back home, having concluded a week-long diplomatic agenda in Europe that started the state visit to London and a support campaign in Paris. Our senior correspondent Oh Siong has a recap and more. Seoul is building its clout as a trusted security partner in the Indo-Pacific region. That's according to experts following President Yoon Suk-yeol's visit to the United Kingdom and France last week. Emphasizing their shared values of freedom, human rights and the rule of law, Yoon's Downing Street Accord with UK leader Rishi Sunak showed an unprecedented level of security cooperation between the two sides, featuring deals on supply chains and the development of sensitive dual-use technologies. Co-developing artificial intelligence and quantum technologies to target North Korean missiles, as well as cybersecurity, which could act as a bridge to strengthen Seoul's links with the Five Eyes Intelligence Group, consisting of the UK, the United States, New Zealand, Australia and Canada, was also part of the deal. The willingness to share intelligence with uh, other countries, in this case South Korea, shows uh, a high level of trust. Uh, in the government of South Korea, also in the uh, intelligence gathering capabilities of South Korea, uh, the military of South Korea as well, right? So in a sense, uh, it's proof that South Korea is considered to be a reliable partner by all these countries. Now, on top of that, these countries can gather intelligence that South Korea cannot, uh, for example, in the Middle East, uh, for example, in Russia. Uh, even if we look at uh, China, for example, they have different assets. Seoul also reaffirmed its value-based cooperation with Paris, agreeing to work together on AI and quantum technology as Presidents Yoon and Macron exchanged views on North Korea's weapons collaboration with Russia and the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East, particularly as South Korea begins its two-year tenure as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council next year. South Korea has also been looking to multilateral platforms and like-minded partners to tackle global challenges that threaten peace, freedom and the rule of law in the international community. Uh, first of all, because we have seen uh, as a result of growing US-China competition, but also uh, the, the Trump administration being, being in office in the past, how South Korea has been looking at other potential partners, uh, not to replace the US, but really to, to complement what it gets uh, from the U.S., U.S.-Japan co cooperation uh, with with Korea is is very much driven by by specific security threats, and I think in the case of Europe, this is not uh, necessarily this, the case. Beyond security and economic interests, South Korea has also grown its capacity to contribute to global development. The country's bid to host the 2030 World Expo has been highlighted as the chance to foster global solidarity towards the goals of tackling inequality, climate change and emerging digital challenges that affect all societies. Presenting Busan as the world's solutions platform based on Korea's own transformation from a war-torn nation to a digital and cultural powerhouse, Yoon has held over 150 summits with 96 countries since its inauguration last year. Oh Siang, Arirang News. Meanwhile, in the port city of Busan this past weekend, for the first time in well over four years, top diplomats of Seoul, Tokyo and Beijing held trilateral talks to address issues of regional interest. Our foreign affairs correspondent Peunji reports. Top diplomats of South Korea, Japan and China sat down for talks on Sunday and agreed to expedite preparations for the upcoming summit between their leaders. The three officials met here at the Durimaru APEC house in Busan and reaffirmed their efforts to hold a trilateral summit at the earliest convenient time. Following the meeting that lasted for about an hour and a half, Seoul's Foreign Minister Park Jin explained that the three officials have decided to put trilateral cooperation back on track as soon as possible. We will continue to work to make sure that the holding of the summit can be materialized in the near future. Park's Japanese and Chinese counterparts Yoko Kamikawa and Wang Yi also highlighted the importance of cooperation between the three countries. China will work together with South Korea and Japan to put the trilateral cooperation back on track and maintain a sound and steady development of trilateral relations. I hope today's foreign minister's meeting could become the opportunity for the three countries to resume trilateral cooperation. The last summit between the presidents of the three countries was held in December 2019 in China. It has not taken place for more than four years, largely due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also because of strained relations between Seoul and Tokyo. South Korea, as the chair of the upcoming summit, had hoped to hold the meeting before the end of this year. 
But the three countries have yet to agree on a specific date. And with a little more than a month remaining, arranging a meeting in 2023 is proving difficult. The Korean government is now reportedly aiming for it to take place sometime early next year. Meanwhile, ahead of the three-way talks, Park also held separate meetings with his Japanese and Chinese counterparts. While meeting the Chinese foreign minister, Park urged Beijing to play a constructive role in persuading North Korea to halt provocations. In response, Wang said China has always played and will continue to play the role needed to help stabilize the situation on the Korean peninsula. During talks with Japan's foreign minister, the two sides discussed issues including a recent South Korean high court ruling that ordered the Japanese government to compensate victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery. Park reiterated Seoul's position that it respects the agreement made in 2015 with Tokyo, which says the two countries agreed to finally and irreversibly resolve the issue. But Kamikawa called the court verdict extremely regrettable and urged South Korea to take appropriate measures. Peunji, Arirang News, Busan. Seoul, Tokyo and Washington held naval drills in waters of the coast of Korea's Jeju-do Island this past Sunday. The drills involved U.S. aircraft carrier USS Carl Vinson, which arrived in Busan last Tuesday in a show of strength amid Pyongyang's persistent provocations, including a spy satellite launch later on the same day. Sunday's trilateral training comes a day after North Korea's claim that its satellite had taken pictures of U.S. Army bases in South Korea Hawaii and Guam. In the Middle East, the hostage prisoner exchange between Israel and Hamas continues with the Palestinian militant group raising the possibility of an extended pause in fighting. Our Isingje has details. On the third day of hostage releases on Sunday, Hamas released 17 hostages, including 13 Israelis, in exchange for 39 Palestinians who had been held at Israeli detention centers. 33 of the Palestinians released by Israel were minors. The exchange came despite a delay of several hours after Hamas accused Israel of violating the agreement, but the issue was resolved through the mediation of Qatar and Egypt. The New York Times reported on the harsh conditions that the hostages faced through the stories of relatives who had spoken to those released by Hamas. The newspaper reported that the hostages lived in complete isolation from the outside world and returned looking emaciated. They mainly ate rice and bread, but there were times when they could not eat, leading to some of them losing as much as 6 to 8 kilograms during the ordeal. Among the released hostages from Gaza was a 4-year-old American girl who had been left orphaned after her parents were killed during the October 7th attack. While praising her release, U.S. President Joe Biden also called on the need to extend the ceasefire so that more hostages can be released moving forward. That's my goal, that's our goal, to keep this pause going beyond tomorrow so that we can continue to see more hostages come out and surge more humanitarian relief into, into those in, who in need in Gaza. The Associated Press reports that Hamas is willing to release more hostages in exchange for an extended ceasefire. Citing sources close to the Palestinian militant group, they're willing to release an additional 20 to 40 hostages with 58 hostages being released in the first three days of the four-day temporary ceasefire so far. It's still short of the reported 240 people taken captive by Hamas on October 7th. Meanwhile, in a video statement to President Biden, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he is open to extending the current ceasefire, but once it is over, the military's ground operation will return in full force. According to the Prime Minister, while the current four-day agreement can be extended to allow more hostages to be released, he stressed that at the end of the deal, Israel will continue its operations to destroy Hamas. Isinje, Arirang News. Here on the local front, third quarter findings show food prices surged past household disposable income. According to Statistics Korea, on this Monday, household disposable income grew 3.1% on year to hit an average of just above 3,000 US dollars. Consumer prices also rose by 3.1%, but those specifically for processed foods and dining out jumped 6.3% and 5.4% respectively implying that food prices are weighing down on household budgets. Officials point out this trend has been persistent for five straight quarters. 
Seoul's economy ministry has shared intentions to better support emerging industries by easing bureaucratic red tape. Our Lee Su Jin explains. South Korea's government is taking steps to bolster emerging industries by reforming and improving current regulations. Finance Minister Chu Gyeong in an emergency meeting on the economy with related ministers on Monday said that while South Korea's economy is showing signs of recovery, the government needs to continue fostering promising businesses in the biohealth, green technology and ocean mobility industries. One way the government is planning to do this is in the biohealth industry where clearer standards will be set for newly created health services. It also plans to ease regulations that will encourage the development of healthcare services that use smart technology. We plan to expand the scope of permitted new medical services by revising guidelines that will encourage the launch of various healthcare services, such as those that will help patients monitor blood pressure and diabetes. And the biohealth industry is not the only area that the government is planning to reform. In the green technology industry, the government is looking to ease regulations to allow for more revamping and repowering of old solar and wind power plants and support the entry of carbon capture companies into industrial complexes. It also plans to discuss ways to expand tax support for low carbon aviation fuels. As part of its efforts to go green and boost emerging industries, the South Korean government has set a target to expand the global market share of the domestic smart ocean mobility sector to 12 percent by 2027. This comes as the International Maritime Organization adopted a strategy to reach net zero emissions from international shipping by around 2050 and set targets to enact a regulatory code for maritime autonomous surface ships by 2028. To expand global market share, the South Korean government plans to boost the transition from fossil fuels to alternative fuels for ships by providing various subsidies and tax benefits. It would also further support R&D for the development of green ship technology. Lee Soo Jin, Arirang News. And K-pop album exports hit a fresh high during the January to October period, surpassing 240 million U.S. dollars. According to the Korea Customs Service back on Sunday, total export album sales surged 20.3 percent on year during the first 10 months of 2023. Exports were driven by 67.3 percent expansion in shipments to the U.S. In contrast, album exports to neighboring China plunged more than 51 percent. Industry insiders have called for close monitoring of these conflicting export trends. Pop-up stores are seeking to better target young consumers by setting up shop in trendy neighborhoods and by offering photo opportunities as well as other fun activities. Our Park Konu was out and about. People wait outside pop-up stores even before opening hours in the cold weather. Among those people, it is easy to spot a lot of so-called Zalphas, a word used to describe members of Gen Z born between 1996 through 2009 and the Alpha generation born after 2010. And an increasing number of pop-up stores catering to Zalpha-aged visitors have been appearing, especially in places such as Songsu, where about 100 pop-up stores open monthly. I'm here at a pop-up store located in Songsu, Eastern Seoul, the site of many pop-up stores. At this store, I'll be riding this boat, one of the activities here that mainly targets the so-called Zalpha generation. Inside, there are a variety of activities for the Zalpha generation to enjoy. The group is also referred to as Funsumers because they tend to seek out fun experiences while buying products. It's great to know what kind of products companies sell and what I can experience through pop-up stores. To target these consumers, brands are working hard to make special pop-up stores. Following the relaxing of COVID-19 measures, pop-up stores have been a great offline marketing means. Brands are trying their best to show their identity while competing with other brands. She added, through these efforts, over a thousand people visit the store daily on average, with Zalfes accounting for around 70 percent of total visitors. She also said that sales at pop-up stores are not as much as the investment put in. According to a professor of consumer science, another reason pop-up stores are popular with the Zalfa generation is that they can make good locations for photos, which can then be posted on social media.
The professor also shared negative aspects of these stores. As these stores open for about two to three weeks, there is a lot of waste after they close. Also, the high cost of opening stores means a higher price for products. Though she was concerned about these problems, she predicted that these stores would continue to be popular. However, she said brands would need to be innovative in terms of operation and structure to keep young customers interested in pop-up stores. Park Geun-hye, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Over the weekend, Russia and Ukraine exchanged large-scale drone attacks. Russia on Saturday morning launched its most intense drone attack since the start of the war on Ukraine, and Kyiv replied on Sunday with drones and missiles. No deaths have been yet reported on either side from the attacks. Ukrainian military reported that Russia launched a total of 75 Iranian-made Shahed drones targeting Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. Of the 75 drones, 74 were destroyed by Ukrainian air defenses. At least five civilians, including an 11-year-old child, were injured, according to the mayor of Kyiv. The Russian Ministry of Defense, meanwhile, reported that on Sunday, Russia shot down 24 Ukrainian drones over Moscow, Tula, Kaluga, and the surrounding areas. The military also reported of two missiles destroyed over the Sea of Azov and Russian air defenses intercepted 53 Ukrainian drones over Ukrainian territory under Russian control. In China, concerns have been rising over a potential outbreak of new infectious respiratory diseases. Following a request for information by the WHO, a spokesperson from China's National Health Commission said Sunday that a novel virus was not behind the wave of illnesses and that influenza is the main cause, followed by rhinoviruses, pneumonia, RSV and the adenovirus. While some experts have said that the current conditions are due to the lifting of COVID-19 lockdown restrictions as exposure to common pathogens had been minimized during lockdown. But outside scientists are asking for the situation to be closely monitored. A cargo ship with 14 crew on board sank off the Greek island of Lesbos on Sunday. One of those aboard has been confirmed dead, with 12 others still missing. The Comoros-flagged cargo ship named Raptor was carrying 6,000 tons of salt from al Dakela port in Egypt to Istanbul when it made a distress call to the Greek Coast Guard reporting a mechanical failure. According to the operating company of the ship based in Lebanon, 11 of the crew were Egyptians, while two were Syrian and one was an Indian national. Authorities are still searching for the missing crew members. In the world of motorsports, the 2023 Formula One season came to a close in Abu Dhabi on Sunday with Red Bull's triple world champion Max Verstappen first past the checkered flag. This year's competition was dominated by Team Red Bull and Verstappen's latest win meant he was number one in 19 out of the 22 races, breaking the record for the most single-season wins. The 26-year-old is now third place in Formula One's all-time list of winners with the 54th win of his career. The 2024 F1 season begins again in Bahrain next March with two additional races, making it a record 24 Grand Prix. Kim ji Arirang News. Good afternoon. Wet clouds are dropping light on and off showers in most areas since early this morning. Northern parts of Gyeonggi-do could see up to 10 millimeters, and the rest of the country could see some spotty rain, so keep an umbrella handy today. But rain could turn to snow in mountainous regions of Gangwon-do province. Not much to complain about temperature-wise today, but as you might have guessed, after today's precipitation lets up and skies become clear, Freezing air will move into the country and will wrap up the November on a freezing note.
But for now, let's check on today's highs. Top temperatures should stay slightly higher than seasonal norms. Seoul seeing highs of 10 degrees this afternoon. Busan and Jeju warm and cozy at 17 degrees, with some late afternoon sunshine expected in Busan. I see cold mornings to persist through the week. Stay bundled while the skies will remain mostly sunny in the capital area this week. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. And that ends Monday's afternoon newscast, but do stay with us for our panel session coming up right after this break. Thank you for now.